Let's talk about one of our first applications, which is binary hypothesis testing. Probability is a foundation for making principal decisions. And instead of using full information, usually we'll be faced with using partial noisy observations. In the literature, we're going to refer to this often as detection theory or hypothesis testing. And in machine learning, there's a related topic known as classification. The key idea is that we need to decide which of two mutually exclusive events has occurred using an observation. All right, let's do some examples. So in digital communication, maybe we are observing a wire. So based on the received voltage on this wire, we need to decide if the transmitted bit was zero or one. In cancer detection, based on a CT scan that we've made, is a tumor present or absent? And finally, in quality control, based on a measurement, we need to decide is a part that we've manufactured defective or not. In this video, we're focusing on two events and scalar observations. But this framework is actually quite general and we can go beyond two events, so deciding between many possibilities and using many observations, as we'll see later. OK, so here's the overall framework. So we have a framework for binary hypothesis testing. And binary refers to the fact that there are going to be two hypotheses, which we'll call H0 and H1. And these are events that partition some underlying sample space omega. OK, so here's omega. And abstractly, there's H0 and H1. And this is kind of what's going on in nature. We don't have control over it. We get a measurement or observation, and we're gonna think about that as a random variable, y. And the random variable could take this could be distributed according to one of the following models. So in the discrete case where y is discrete, we either have a conditional PMF if h0 occurs or a different conditional PMF if h1 occurs. So there's py given h0 of y, if H0 in fact occurred, and if instead H1 occurred, the observations Y are generated according to PY given H1. In the continuous case, it's the same thing, but now we have PDFs instead of PMFs. So we can model this kind of process, right? So this is basically how our measurements are being made. We can make a, a mathematical model. So here's our mathematical model. This is just a cartoon for now, no equations. Okay, so what's going on is that if H0 is generated, you'll see a measurement in this picture with mean kind of to the left, spread out like this blue distribution. And if it, in fact, H1 occurred, you'll see the mean more to the right and spread out using this red um, distribution. And finally, we build a detector or a decision rule. And what that's going to do is it's a function of this observation Y and it puts out zero if it thinks that H0 in fact occurred, and it puts out one if it thinks that H1 occurred. Okay, and our job is to design this. All right, so we have this little detector, and it observes the value of Y, and it puts out um, U, which is either zero or one. Okay, and the trick is we're not going to be able to make perfect decisions. So what we have to do is partition the range of Y using our decision rule, Okay, so what that means is there's going to be a region A0, that's where we're deciding zero based on Y, and there's a region A1 where we decide one based on Y. And an error will occur if we're wrong. So if we decide H1, but it was actually H0, that's an error. And if we decide H0, but it was actually H1, that's also an error. So writing this out as an event, an error is the union of Y being in A1 when it's H0, or y being an a0 when it's h1. So we make our decision only based on y, and then we check if we fell into the decision region for one, and it's actually zero, that's a mistake. Or if we made a decision that it's zero, and it's actually one, that's a mistake. And so one way to measure the performance overall is just to calculate the probability of error. And so in this case, what that means, we just have this thing we call PE, it's the probability of this error event, and using the multiplication rule, we can just write it out 
as the conditional probability of error given h0 times the probability of h0 plus the conditional probability of error given h1 times the probability of h1. So that works out to just being the probability you fall into a1 given that it's h0 times probability of h0 plus the probability you fall into a0 given that it's h1 times the probability of h1. In the discrete case, these error probabilities work out as follows. So you sum up in the discrete case over these events. Okay, and so what's going on here is that in the um, error event, when it's actually h0 and I fall into a1, I just sum up over the region a1, the probabilities I would have gotten from h0. And in the case where it is h1 and I fall into a0, I sum up the probabilities of h1 that I would have seen based on h1 over the range a0. In the continuous case, exactly the same thing, but I'm replacing my sums with integrals across the region a1 and the region a0. Okay, and so the key thing to notice about these is that the region and the probability model are different. So I'm integrating over a1 when it's actually a0 and integrating over a0 when it's actually h1. Those are where I'm making mistakes. It's easier to understand this with some visualizations. So one of the motivations for detection theory was originally um, detecting an aircraft using a radar signal. Okay, and this motivated the following terminology, which we're going to use as well in this course because it's quite common. So there's the probability of a false alarm. Okay, we write that as PFA, and that is the probability that you fall into A1 given that it's H0. Why is that a false alarm? Well, there's nothing there, so there's no aircraft, but you're declaring that there is an aircraft, so it's a false alarm. On the other side is missed detection, which we write as PMD. That's the probability that you say there's nothing there, but in fact, there is an aircraft. Okay, so in the discrete case, what does this look like? Let's draw kind of a cartoon of our um, probability model. Okay, so let's see what we have here. We have this blue PMF and this red PMF, and I'm just filling it in all the way. So this blue PMF goes over this whole uh, space. So it's higher on the left and lower on the right, whereas the red PMF is higher on the right, lower on the left. And I have to decide, just based on my observation why, whether it was H0 or H1, okay? And right now what I'm gonna do is just pick two regions and just declare them to be A0 and A1. So here I'm gonna pick A1 because red is higher. Here I'm gonna pick A0. Notice that red is still higher in this last point at the origin. That's okay. I'm just kind of arbitrarily putting it into A0, but I could have done it the other way and put it into A1. We'll see how to do this the best way in a little bit. Right now I'm just arbitrarily mapping these regions as I've shown. So to get the probability of false alarm, what I do is I find all the blue points that fall into this green region and I add up their probabilities. Those are all the um, blue points or all the H0 um, points that I'm going to make mistakes on because whenever they happen, I'm going to still declare that one happened. And the misdetection is going to be all these red points that fall into the A0 region. In the continuous case, I'm going to get a very similar picture. Let's just draw some conditional PDFs. And I'm going to have some decision regions. Again, I'm just kind of arbitrarily picking these decision regions here. And I'm just integrating here where I did not decide blue. So A1 is where I'm not deciding that H0 has occurred. So I'm going to make mistakes. And here, similarly, I integrate over A0, I'm going to get where I make mistakes on the red. Okay, and the overall probability is just the weighted sum of false alarm and misdetection. Okay, our job overall is to design a decision rule, D of Y, that gets a low probability of error. So I don't want to make mistakes. And the best thing I could do is design a decision rule that I'm sure gets me the smallest possible probability of error. So one option is to use the maximum likelihood or ML rule, which we write as DML. And what it's going to do is pick the hypothesis with the highest likelihood value. Okay, to be precise in the discrete case, what that means is I'm going to say, I think one occurred, 
when py of h1 at y is greater than py of h0 um, at y. And then otherwise I'm gonna pick zero. So visually, what's that going to look like? So here's blue py given h0, and here's red py given h1. Let's see where I'm going to pick um, decision zero, okay? So you can see this orange uh, region, a0, that's where blue was higher. And this green region is where red was higher. That's exactly what this rule tells me to do. Continuous case is exactly the same thing, except instead of a conditional PMF, I'm using a conditional PDF to make my decisions, right? I'm deciding one when the conditional PMF given H1 is higher, zero otherwise, right? And so let's just draw this picture, blue and red. So where am I going to decide for blue? So blue is where, um, so, this A0 region is where blue is highest and A1 is where red is highest. And the ties can be broken in any way that you like. To keep things simple in this course, we are mapping them to one just to write a simpler decision rule, but you could do it a different way. It doesn't really matter. At the ties, it's not going to affect your performance regardless of how you map them. Okay, the other option is to use the maximum a posteriori or map rule which we write as dmap. What that's going to do makes a little more sense. It's going to select the hypothesis that is the most likely given the observation, okay? So to, to frame that a little differently, what we were doing in the ML rule is we were picking the hypothesis that best explains what we see. And here, what we're doing is just picking the most likely hypothesis based on what we see. And these are related, but not quite the same. In the discrete case, it turns out what you need to do for the map rule is decide one when the weighted conditional PMF given H1 is higher than that given H0, and zero when the weighted PMF of H0 is higher, okay? So visually what that means is I take the same example here and I'm going to scale these points by their conditional PMF. So let's say that um, H0 here is one third, okay? So I'm making these blue points a third of their height, and then H1 has to be two thirds to make probability sum to one, and so I'm scaling these to be two thirds of their original height. And you see that the relationship in heights has changed a little bit. So in one place, blue is higher, then now they're equal. In another place, um, you know, so that actually changed the decision towards red. So. Now the A0 region is just going to be um, the points where blue is higher, that's just one place, and the rest are for A1. The continuous case, case same thing, I weight by pH1 and pH0 on the conditional PDF, okay? And I just look to see where this weighted um, thing is higher. All right, so here I'm gonna start out with my original conditional PDFs, and then I'm gonna rescale them by a third and two thirds. And these values have to be given to me. So someone has to tell me the probability of H0 and the probability of H1, right? So I need to be able to derive it from the problem statement. Okay, and there's where blue is higher, that's where red is higher. So how do we arrive at this rule? Let's look in the discrete case. Well, the discrete case says pick H1 when it's more likely than H0 given that Y is equal to Y. Okay, that makes sense. This is actually the most sensible thing to do. Pick the most likely hypothesis given the observation. Well, let's use Bayes' rule and just open this up. So we're flipping the conditioning. So we're saying y equals y given h1 times probability of h1 divided by probability of y equals y. Same thing for h0. This is exactly Bayes' rule to flip the conditioning. And I'm just crossing out the denominator because they're the same. And I see that this is actually the same thing as what I wrote above. So basically, deciding the most likely hypothesis is the same as taking the conditional distribution and weighting it by the hypothesis probability. Okay, it turns out the map rule is optimal. It's the best possible thing you could do to get the smallest probability of error. And what I'm gonna do now is describe why that's the case. If you're not interested in why, you could probably just end the video right here. The important thing to remember, remember is the map rule will get you the lowest probability of error. The ML rule 
might get you the same probability of error. It might be a little higher. There's no guarantee it'll give you the lowest. So why does it give us the lowest? Well, let's write the probability of error. That's just the probability that I make an error given y is equal to little y weighted by the probability mass function of y. That's one particular way of writing the error. You'll see why I want to do this in a moment. Okay, and this probability of an error given that y is equal to y is going to be the probability of h0 if I fall into decision region 1 and the probability of h1 if I fall into decision 0. So basically, when I'm actually deciding 1, I'll make a mistake only on the fraction of times when it's h0. And when I'm deciding 0, I'll only make mistakes when I fall into h1. Okay, so let's just write this out. So I'm expanding this probability of error in terms of what I've written here. And I'm using this funny way of expressing it where I'm encoding that I'm going to use this case-by-case -case function. And so when dy is equal to 1, I want the case-by-case -case to be probability of h0 given y. That's what I have. And when dy is equal to 0, that's the same as saying 1 minus dy is going to be equal to 1. Then I want to use probability of h1 given y. Okay, so you can convince yourself these two lines are the same thing. And now I'm just going to group terms together. So I'm going to get a term that only depends on h1 up here, and then a term that's dy and takes the difference of the probability of h0 and the probability of h1 given y. Okay, and so the key here is that if this term, when probability of h0 is less than probability of h1, this term contributes negatively to the overall probability of error. And so keeping it is good, and that's because if it's negative, it's lowering the probability of error. So I want to keep this term in the sum, and so I'm going to pick this term to stay in the sum by setting dy equals to 1 here. If on the other hand it's positive, then I don't want to keep it because it's contributing positively to the probability of error and increasing it. And so I want to get rid of it by setting dy equals to 0. Okay, And this is actually the map rule. So if you go back to the previous slide, this is the same thing. And ties can go either way. So since the map rule is the best, why not use it exclusively? Well, the problem is, in practice, we may not know the probabilities of the hypotheses. Okay, we could still use the ML rule in that case, but not the map rule. And another reason might be the costs of false alarm and misdetection might be unequal. So for instance, deciding that a malignant tumor is benign seems to have a higher cost than falsely declaring a benign tumor is malignant. If I say a benign tumor is malignant, maybe I undergo a bit of extra testing. But if I say a malignant tumor is benign, then I've missed um, something that I actually need to treat. Okay, so the map rule is always weighting the two kinds of errors equally. Maybe I want a different weighting. And it also presumes I know the true hypothesis probabilities, which in many cases we do not know um, exactly.